But uh, you've been hearing probably giants um, five weeks, five weeks straight ab uh, about talking about giants, and, and you're probably up to here or hear about hearing about giants. Well, the good news is, is next week starts Advent. It transitions, and and really, the, the truth is, is that we won't stop talking about giants. Um, we'll always have giants in our lives. Not saying that the sermon series changes a little bit, uh, but we will always have giants in our lives, amen? Um, and so, but the good thing is, I, I don't expect to hear a lot of amens after I said that. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to giants in my life. Uh, but uh, uh, the amen that I would expect to hear is that Christ has won the victory. Amen. There we go. There's the amen. He, and it's for his glory, and, for, and it's for his victory for you, your victory. And um, so you might be looking at me, and, 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 and uh, you might have already faced the giant. You might have a name for it. It's not like a pet or anything like that. It's, it's really the thing that comes in front of your face. It's the insurmountable thing that you cannot handle on your own, uh, that you cannot defeat on your own. Uh, but you've named the giant. Many of you have named the giant, and some of you have said, you know what, I don't know what the giant is. Um, maybe somewhere midway through the series that you've been able to identify, yeah, you know, I, I wrestle with that or I, I deal with that. Last week, Jimmy did a great job of talking about a, a addiction. And a lot of times whenever we think of a addiction, we think it from the standpoint of substance abuse, uh, some type of substance. But Jimmy brought to, to light um, that it's not always about substance. It's about things in which we go for comfort, things that we, we turn to apart from Christ. It's, it's the idol in our lives sometimes, in our lives. And so I, I got the question uh, posed to me, is there one giant that is more dangerous than any of the other giants that we face? Um, and I had to think about it for a little bit because obviously you guys have your bulletin and in your bulletin, you're assuming that we're gonna talk about temptation. Uh, the Lord kind of changed that. Uh, we had done uh, uh, planning this series probably in September whenever we, whenever Cassandra and I came back from a sabbatical. We had, we had mapped out and planned out who was preaching what and what we were gonna talk about. We really wrestled with this as a staff of, of what we would talk about and the, how we were going to wrap it up was talking about temptation but midway through this week uh, Tiffany as she did her bulletin uh, she had the anticipation and the expectation that we're going to talk about temptation because it was September whenever we planned it God changed that uh, because the question came to my, my heart and I really had to wrestle with this and, and even in light of looking at you in the face and saying and, and, and thinking what maybe you and I both corporately hand in hand wrestle with is there one giant that is more dangerous than any other giants that we face let's name them okay What's, some of the di giants in which that David had to face was the giant of losing a child uh, I talked about that kind of the, the, the overwhelming sense in, the, in the, the fear topic, the overwhelming sense of that I'm going to have to face this. And so you become so protective that or less risk taking in your life or you, you seek comfort in the midst of all those fears to compensate those fears of losing something. And so therefore that, that we kind of stagnate and we don't necessarily uh, step out on faith in certain things and so we, we protect, overcompensate, we overprotect our, our children, we overprotect uh, the things that we have, and we just, maybe we just clam up and, 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 and look inwardly and, or maybe even become uh, hermitless, a hermit type of people. Uh, stay indoors, don't associate with people. Um, the, the sexual temptation that D David had to face, uh, we know that that was a big, big flaw. We talk about typology, how David represents the Christ in our life, but David, David even fell short. As the great example, the, the, the man that was after God's own heart, he still fell short because he was not God. And so he, he faced a sexual temptation uh, that was in his life as 
well. And then there's the, the giant of comfort. There's the giant of, of temptation. And for some of you, it might be more physical. It might not be a spiritual aspect of it. It could be just simply, I face diabetes. I face an, a, a, a weight issue. I face a, I, I face a cancer issue. Those are physical things. I, I face a financial dilemma. Those are particular physical things in which that can creep in and steal your joy and really be there to haunt you and taunt you and, and really the purpose behind it as Satan uses those tools is to destroy your, your spiritual life even if they are physical things. So we're going to talk about this other giant that David faced and that the Israelite people faced in their life. It's a giant that might be more dangerous. I'm proposing this. It's, it's, it's an opinion, and you can take it as whether or not that it lands upon you. It is definitely a, an opinion, but I'm going to back up, and you can get something. It might not be the most dangerous one in your life, but I'm going to propose that this is the most dangerous giant that you're going to face face, okay? Um, if you're facing a giant, I've asked you over the fa past few weeks that um, what is something that could possibly happen to you that would shake your faith? Um, or maybe some giant that you can't resist the taunt. Uh, is there a giant more dangerous than any other giant? And obviously I have a suspicion that there are some that I want to, to tell you a story that I, that I shared uh, that Louis Giglio shares in his book, uh, Goliath Must Fall. It inspired this, this series. And really what, it, what he talks about is he talks about this lady that ended up getting mauled, killed by a tiger that she had raised from infancy. Right? He, he talks about this. He read an article. He picks up the newspaper. He reads this article about this tiger that mulls this, the owner that she raised as a cub. And so Louis Giglio reads this article and he's just thinking, for, for one, oh, that's awful. That's awful that she got killed by this, this tiger. That's a, his first reaction. His second reaction is this Who would own a tiger? Right? I mean, you know what tigers do? I mean, not, yeah, do you know what tigers do for a living? <laughs> to live, they hunt, they kill, they, they are strategic hunters. They, who would own something like that? And who would believe that if, I mean, for you, there's a little bit of comfort in thinking that, okay, so if you rose, raise something since its infancy, maybe that it, they would think it as your mother or father and that they wouldn't turn upon you, right? It wouldn't turn upon you and so that, that maybe that there's some safekeeping. And then he in turn proposes another idea. Is that not something in which the, when we think about giants, whenever we talk about sin, whenever we talk about certain things that what we entertain, at first they start off like a cub, innocent, they wouldn't turn upon you. It seems like safe. A lot of things that what we turn to, whether it's substance abuse, whether it's sexual temptation, whether it, 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 is, it is some type of, of eating, uh, whether it's some type of, of being tempted to talk about other people, at first it seems as if that it's innocent. Nobody that has been overcome by a giant you don't just bring a giant into your home. It's awkward, right? It's, it starts off as a baby. And then all of a sudden it just grows and grows and grows until it becomes like literally the metaphor, the elephant that's in the room. It starts off as a baby. I don't know. I don't really understand the, the illustration because a baby elephant starts off as a baby elephant and it's still large. But it definitely becomes the giant that's in the room. It seems harmless. And at the very beginning, it seems like that it brings you a little bit of joy. It brings you a little bit of comfort. It brings you maybe just a sense of hope, of, of relief or release for that matter. As it's, in, in, as it's innocent in its infancy and then all of a sudden you wake up one day and you've got a giant. You've got a lion. You've got a tiger in your living room and you're thinking, what am I going to do with this? 
Most giants in our lives start that way. So let me just read you, read you a couple of passages of scripture. Let's just start with 1 Samuel chapter 13. We're kind of going back from 1 Samuel chapter 17 and it kind of frames the story of, of the nation of Israel. And it starts in 1 Samuel chapter 13 starting with verse 19. It's very interesting here. It says not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel. Not a blacksmith, not a single blacksmith. Because the Philistines had said, otherwise the Hebrews will make swords and spears. I, I find this so interesting. So all of Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plowshares, their mattocks and axes, and sickles sharpened. The price was two-thirds of a shekel for sharpening plowshares and mattocks, and a third of a shekel for sharpening forks and axes for repointing goads. So on the day of battle, listen, not a soldier was Saul and Jonathan had a sword or spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. I look back on that and I'm trying to find some other support text to, to, to say, was there a time frame in which that the nation of Israel, the Hebrew people, did not have iron stuff? There was not a blacksmith to be found in the nation of Israel. And you can go back and you can find actual historical support text to saying, here's the time frame. And this is gonna blow your mind because it overshadows this battle over this giant called Goliath. History shows us that not until King Solomon did the nation of Israel, David introduced it, but they didn't perfect it and become part of their, their livelihood until King Solomon. So we had King Saul, all during King Saul's reign. Not that there was not a, a blacksmith, meaning that they didn't have swords. The only people that had armor was Saul and his son Jonathan. And so, no wonder these people were shaking in their boots whenever Goliath came. The only people that had really good weapons was Saul and his, his son Jonathan. What did the other people have? Well, they had slingshots. They had, they had long sticks. Um, some of them had pointy tips on the ends of them. I want you to get, hear me whenever I say this. The Hebrew people were really good at the weapons that they had. But in comparison to the Philistines that had swords, knives, full metal jacket type of armory, they looked puny compared to the giant that taunted them every single day. But not only that, if you wanted substance, if you wanted to plow your fields, if you wanted to, to harvest your food, you want to know who you had to go to? The enemy. It's like the baby cub, the baby tiger cub. It might think that you can't live without it. The nation of Israel, although that they are looking over to the Philistines and God has already announced, proclaimed who they are, you're looking at the enemy. In order to, they thought to themselves, they can't live without sickles, plowshares, mattoxes. And so what they had to do, they had to go to the Philistines. They had to go into enemy territory to receive what they thought that they needed for substance. To plow their fields, to plant their, their crops, to harvest their crop. It's the baby tiger. And so we skip ahead to, to chapter 17, and here it is, this daunting task, calling out, bring me out your champion. And you want to know what the enemy does? Whenever David comes out, there's a couple of things I want to point out and we'll move on. The enemy does is David comes out it's not like that, that Goliath should be surprised that he comes with a slingshot and a stick. But this is how the enemy does. You should have, the enemy would look at David and say, you should have came to the Philistines for better weapons. As he stands in the valley and looks at the enemy and says, listen, you come with, with sticks and, 
and rocks like a dog? In other words, what he's ultimately saying, we're the ones that have the weapons. We are better equipped. So you come out, out here with that particular confidence? And not only that, it was the giant in which that Saul believed, he bought into. He bought into this, this lie because of this. You want to know what he tried to equip David with? The only battle metal weaponry that was metal in the land. If you're going to go out here, why don't you, why don't you fight fire with fire? Why don't you fight like the Philistines would fight? With iron. And it kind of sets the whole context where it says this. I don't fight with the enemy's weapons. I don't tear people down. I don't taunt people. I don't tear other people's down so I can build up an ego. I come in the name of the Lord. I've, I'm equipped with the name of the Lord and I believe that this is his will because he said it today is what, what's going to happen. This giant's going to come down. This giant is going to come down. Here's the thing. Some giants are in our lives because we want them. Some giants are in our lives because we want them there. We coddle them. We feel like that, we feel like that they give us comfort and temporary joy. And one day we wake up and we said, how did we get there? We didn't invite the giant over for, for supper one day. Ultimately, it grew and it became a tiger. And it comes to kill. And it comes to steal. And it comes to destroy. See, I think a person that begins to abuse substance or alcohol or drugs, whatever that substance is, I think that he thinks about that thing or, or she thinks about the th thing and they, they think it brings them comfort and pleasure. Or the person that, that begins to enter to a, a place of negative thinking, this thinking or a conversation, this kind of maybe in a sense seems like that it's good. We can wrap it in, oh, this is really a prayer request. <laughs> uh, I something is something being cooked back there it's a it's a fire alarm just so you know <laughs> stay calm everybody <laughs> it's just a giant uh, in the name of Jesus it's going to fall um, so in a good way, it, it kind of feels like this conversation that ends up happening, whether it seems like that it's good, it's wrapped, it's packaged, like that it's good, it feels good. They end up saying stuff negative. They become pessimistic. And all of a sudden, you become unkind, you become angry, and it, over, it, over, it, it overcomes you. So what a person begins to allow lust to come up and take space in their minds it becomes comfortable. It might be pleasurable. It brings joy in a sense until it grows to a point where it becomes a giant. And we've become, that we, can, we get, get to a place where we think that there's no way in the world that we can overcome this particular giant. It felt safe. I feel safe with iron swords. I feel safe in the enemy's territory because it seems like it has the appearance as if that they are equipped better. The enemy is better. Whenever we look at the world and negative thinking comes into our mind and we say, this life of Christ, Christ doesn't know what's best for me. We don't really say that, but we really live that way. And so isn't it fun to say that I don't like it, but here's what I believe. And I don't want you to misunderstand me because I believe that some would look at cancer in the, in the eye and say, that's my big giant. That's my big giant. Um, and it might not apply to, apply to you, okay? But, but giants are in our lives because, and I, I really wanted to choose this carefully, some giants are in our lives because we want them. 
we are kind of impressed or we are kind of molded by this thought is that we are what we become what we love. We're molded by this particular thought. I, I'm going to become this because I love it. We don't really have this anticipation as if that we're gonna, here's the thing, I don't know about you guys, but Barbara and Earl, they've lived, lived and loved each other so much, I hope that you don't find this offensive, but you guys look like you belong together. You love each other, you look like that you live together so long that you become each other. You become what you love. In a sense, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we love Christ so much that whenever people look at us that we say, oh, I don't see Kaysen. I don't see Farrell Wallace. I see Jesus Christ. Not with what you do, but who you are. You love that person so much, you become who they are. So there's a giant out there that wants to assault me, that wants to kill me, that wants to destroy me. I haven't really told you what that giant was, the most dangerous one yet. Are you, are you ready for it? I'm not ready to share yet, just yet, okay? So here it is. Let's, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. And I think that maybe that you'll, you'll get the point here. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1 through 6. I apologize if you can't read that. Uh, you're focusing in on this right here, but here, here it is. If you have your own Bibles, 1 Samuel chapter 30. Um, David and his men, men re reached Ziglag on the third day. Now the Amalekites, this is after, uh, just, so, just some historical context here. This is after David slayed Goliath. This is after Samuel had died and anointed David as king and God has rejected Saul, but Saul is still the king and Saul is, is pursuing David because he's jealous. And not only that, here's another thing, is that there's some people that are following David David, uh, because he's slaying tens of thousands in the name of the Lord and not in the name of his kingdom. And so there's people that are following him, and guess what happens? He says, they attacked Ziglag and they burned it. And they had taken captive the women, all who were in it, both young and old, and they killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on the way. When David and his men came to Ziglag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. Why? Why? They're kind of upset that their, their wives and their children are gone. David's two wives, yeah, he had two of them, had been captured. Uh, you know, uh, this is a name that you guys should uh, name your 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 first uh, daughter, Ahinoam, 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 that sounds like a redneck, Ahinoam, that's what I did, Ahinoam, of Jezreel and Abigail, we, we name children that, don't we, the widow of Nabal of Carmel, David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him, each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. I mean, if you're a leader of a place and these bad things start happening to you, what do you do? David had giants on the north, the south, the east, the west. He had people, he had giants surrounded him and they were in his own camp. They were his friends at one time until bad things started to happen and it was just like, this is what we got for lining up with you. Do we ever, are we ever tempted in that moment to where we say sometimes in our lives that we, and I've heard it, you just be honest with yourself. You don't tell somebody else's story. You be honest with yourself and say at some point in time you've lined yourself up with Christ and you're hoping, you have this expectation that good things are coming, co gonna come your way. We heard, we hear Sunday school teachers, we hear preachers on, on TV said blessings are coming, bring in the camels. <laughs> camels are coming your way. You know, I heard preachers preach that in my life. You know, you line yourself up with Christ, he's gonna give you camel after camel. What are you gonna do with camels? It's metaphorical, just so you know. I mean, your, your bank account, God's going to bless you monetarily, or not even that, that no, no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. That means that 
cancer's not going to come strike you or strike your family or, or some tragic accident and whenever tragedy comes, it's on the left and right and you ask the question, why did I even line myself with, uh, up with you? Why did I do that? I stopped short. I didn't finish all of verse 6. Let me tell you something. This is why that David is the hero in this story. Actually, God's the hero, but, but David, we get a glimpse into his heart, and that's why he's the most beloved king. This is why the, he's the most beloved storyteller, uh, uh, story being told. This is why. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Giants were surrounding him. Giants was on his left, his right, his front, his back, all around him. And you want to know what he could have done? He could have said, the right, why? And so I think in the midst of trouble, the, the most dangerous, the most dangerous giant that we could ever face in our life is whenever, whenever we start depending upon somebody other than God whenever trouble comes our way. That's whenever we start turning to substance. That's whenever we start turning to sometimes logic. Ourselves is saying, listen, huh, I think I know what's best. And I've been here. God, you've equipped me. I don't have to ask you what's right and what's, what's wrong. So, let me just say this real quick. Let me get this off the screen so you're not distracted here. So uh, seven years ago, seven and a half years ago, uh, my wife and I, yesterday, we went to Visai, Oklahoma for this um, Thanksgiving deal. And we, we took a drive through the neighborhood. That's where we came from, Lauren, if you didn't know that. Uh, we, we moved from Visai, Oklahoma to here seven years ago, and we spent a lot of time there. I, I was telling Cassandra, I said, 10 years in this place, and I'm, I'm driving around here, and I don't even remember this house. It was just right across the street. I don't even remember that that was here. You know, what? I, I, it's so unfamiliar to me, but we spent so much time there to the place that what we just really felt like this is our, our, our roots go deep in Visai. And to get a call from a district superintendent that says that, hey, Watonga Church of the Nazarene is looking for a pastor. I don't know if you know that or not. And your name came up. I said, did it. Yeah, I said it like that, did it. Because the dreadful thought of, of moving or uprooting, taking a move, I don't know if you know anything about me, and this might shed some light, Jimmy, of some of the questions that you might have. For me, I, I like stability. And so a giant in my life is saying, if God, God says move, I would have a hard time. I would, I would definitely wrestle with whether or not that that's, that's the case. <laughs> Are you sure? Maybe I didn't hear that correctly. You got, long story short, I remember in that board meeting and, and, and I, I felt like the, that we were in one accord and I, I just felt, felt like that, that God wanted to do something different in Cassandra and I's life. We weren't telling anybody at the time. We came to the, the uh, uh, we set out in the parking lot and I remember uh, just kind of twiddling our thumbs and, and just saying, we're not just gonna get out, we're gonna, we're gonna pray about this. And so we set out in the parking lot. It was dark at the time because it was winter months and board members were already here and we prayed together. And at the end of that meeting, what we did is we came to this, this altar right here. I don't know if it was this one, but I mean, it was in this position right here. And the board members just prayed uh, over us and we were just seeking guidance and, and wisdom for it. Um, they had a church vote after we came and, and uh, it wasn't unanimous. Uh, some of you still don't like me uh, even after that, but uh, seven years, but, but here I am, you know, but, but the thought and the question of, of should this be the move, we didn't really think about it logic. We wanted to think about it logically. We wanted to think about it, what's some pros and cons from this? Becoming a, from a youth pastor to a lead pastor, it kind of made me sick to my stomach. I mean, I've had people, I only was in the realm of people younger than me and naive, not dumb, 
but they would believe what I taught them and some adults can be daunting they could question you whether or not that you have a, you need a CDL to drive a 15 passenger van or not it's okay to question <laughs> but it was covered with prayer it wasn't hasty we were patient and I want you, I want you to find find some some hope in in this first Samuel chapter 37 through 8 says then David came to Abathar the priest the son of Amalek bring me the ephod you might say what in the world is ephod well it's a garment it's a priestly garment that people put upon themselves uh, it, it was a garment of praise it was a, a garment of, of seeking the Lord and so here is more he found strength this is how David found strength in the Lord he said bring me the ephod he says, Abathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord. He says, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? This is how God, it. pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. I'm not going to read you the rest of the story, but you'll find in 1 Samuel chapter 30 that God was true to his word. that they overcome everything that those gangly raiders had came and raided. If you're interested, here's what an ephod looks like. We don't, we don't use this in, in today's worship. We don't put it, put it on. Um, but this was kind of the garment, the priestly garment that, is, that was to be wore when seeking the Lord. It would just seem as if that it would be a no-brainer for David, don't you think? Somebody took what was yours. I think we have this mentality of, I already know what the answer is from God. Go after it. It's yours. Should I sue the pants off of somebody whenever they've done me wrong? Absolutely, without a doubt. That's kind of our knee-jerk reaction, right? Our knee-jerk re reaction is, I'm going to get mine. <laughs> I don't care what, I mean, God's mind's already made up. And you want to know who God is? Me. So, not that David had the courtesy, but David had in his makeup, before he went and got his, which he thought that it was just rightfully his, I'm going to inquire of the Lord first. He's got, he's got people that are griping at him. How dare you? What, I mean, what's, let's stone David. It's his fault. I, want to, I don't want to risk getting stoned, and so I'm going to please these people before I inquire of the Lord. So David inquires of the Lord. It's one thing. The giant... The big giant <clears throat> that I think that is the most dangerous one is that we depend so much upon ourselves. We think that we think that we've got this. But the truth of the matter is that we were made to be dependent. Can you hear me? This is how God made you and I. We were made to be dependent. And if we are not dependent upon Him, you're going to be dependent on something. And I think the thing that destroys us the most is ourselves. We are so dependent on ourselves. <laughs> when we set our hearts on what God wants, giants fall. But whenever we set our heart on what we want, we fall. Some of you might be thinking, well, I don't have an ephod. How do I, how do I inquire of God? What does that even look like? I don't have a priestly garment. For that matter, Casey, you look like a hobo up there if you're the one that's looking, looking to inquire of the Lord. Well, we might not have an ephod, but there's some good news. This is from Hebrews chapter 1, two through, uh, one through 2. 
In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets and many times in various ways. I would say the various ways today is the ephod. In our context and what we're talking about, put on the ephod and you can inquire of the Lord. Well, that's one various way in which that God spoke to them in the past. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. Can I just tell you something just kind of in, in, in closing? Is that I truly believe there's a lot that I propose to you today, but I believe that there's a lot of us that we can inquire. Let's inquire so-and-so because they have, they've got some, some wisdom. And I believe that there is some wisdom in this. But here's the, here's the truth. If you're looking for a move, if you're looking about whether or not that you should do something, um, I truly believe that it's important that you inquire of the Lord. I believe that he has given you the ability to do so. <laughs> I believe that God speaks through his son and he continues to speak. Maybe we're just apprehensive about even inquiring of the Lord because we're afraid that he don't speak because the truth is he does speak. He continues to speak. There's somebody in this room that might be screaming inside themselves saying, hey, Kason, I don't have a giant. <clears throat> Maybe the giant in the room is yourself. And I believe, I believe this is a great way to kind of close out this series in the, in the whole giant uh, series that we're, we're, what we're doing here. But here's the thing, whenever we run to the enemy for comfort, whenever we run to our, ourself or our own logic, I think sometime, uh, well, without a doubt, without a question, we begin to fail, we begin to fall, and we get in the place in which God is supposed to be in. We need to inquire of the Lord. And I believe the giants will fall. <clears throat> you know, um, we can look at David and we can say, hey, that lady taking a bath in that bathtub, he wasn't th such a great, he wasn't such a great influence or a, a great example. But he was considered to be a man after God's own heart. And I think, uh, I just propose to, maybe, the, maybe this is not the most dangerous giant, but I truly believe as I look at David's life and I can see if I want to be a man after God's own heart, if I want to be a woman, if I want to be a family man, if I want to be a businessman after God's own heart, I got to be talking, I got to be communion be in communion with the Lord. Whenever we talk about these weapons in which the enemies had and, the, and, and they felt like that they, they had a monopoly on it, these iron swords, you know, the enemy is not, has never been defeated by a sword. We see Peter in the example in, in the New Testament to where that, that he takes a sword and he cuts off a, a guy's ear thinking that this is, this is the way in which that I'm going to save the Savior. And Jesus rebukes him and says, if you want to live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. And I'm going to show you a different weapon. It was the cross that was the strongest weapon against the enemy. So for you and I that have a particular giant that tends to, to taunt you and make fun of you and deceive you and tempt you, your weapon is the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. Would you stand to your feet?